Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I won't go past my allotted time. This will end at 5.45. <clears throat> and this is a small group, so if you have any questions, you can interrupt me at any time. My name is Sherman Shiraishi. Uh, I'm a local attorney. I've been practicing for 40 years. I went to Waimea High School. Uh, this is going to be real informal, yeah, but uh, you shouldn't consider this to be legal advice, yeah? Every, by nature, uh, everything that I talk about is going to be real general, so it may not fit your specific situation. So you should consult with your own legal advisor regarding any questions that you may have. <clears throat> Karen Taketa told me to talk about trust, powers of attorney, and health directors. But you know, depending on what you folks are interested in, you can ask me questions about anything to do with estate planning. <clears throat> okay, I have some clients in the room too, and and <laughs> and the first thing I want to talk about is about some changes in the tax laws. You know, it used to be that uh, uh, the Estate tax exemption was only six hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Okay, it is now over eleven million dollars per person. If you're married, you can shelter uh, twenty-two million. Okay, the problem is that uh, the estate tax, the federal estate tax today, is not coupled with the Hawaii estate tax. Under prior Hawaii law, whatever the federal rate was, Hawaii said, that's our exemption, that's our credit. In 2017, the Hawaii legislature said the tax credit for Hawaii would be whatever it was in 2017 for the Fed rate. So the Fed rate in 2017 was $5,450,000. Okay, so that's the Hawaii estate tax credit. But in the meantime, under Trump, you know, they raised the rate to $11 million. So this is why we have a discrepancy in the law. So even though you may be, your estate may be exempt from federal estate taxes, because it's less than $11 million, your estate might still be liable for state taxes, yeah, because it's over 5450000 <coughs> and a lot of you might be thinking, hey, I don't have that much, but some of you may have that much. So just to let you know, <coughs> you know, how you own ownership to your property is really important. I cannot talk about wills or trusts without explaining the importance of proper ownership of your assets. And by your assets, I mean your bank accounts, your life insurance, your house, your investments, your retirement plans. <clears throat> a lot of people are under the impression that, hey, a will will cover all of your assets, okay? Your will only covers assets in your sole name. Only, only your name on it. So for example, if I own my house under my name only, and I do a will that gives everything to my wife, then when I pass away, she gets it. So I might do a will that gives everything to my wife, if alive, otherwise to my children in equal shares. But if I own my home jointly with some or all of my children, when I pass away, it goes to my children, even though my will says it goes to my wife. Okay, so how you hold ownership is real important. Question. Is that automatic, or do you have to probate anything, or pay estate taxes if you have joint tenancy? Okay, uh, joint tenancy is by operation of law. It's automatic. Okay, if you have it in your sole name, then it may have to go through probate. Okay, so why don't we turn, everybody has the outline, right? Okay. 
Turn to page two, the different types of ownership in property. <clears throat> so this deals with real property, yeah? So you can, one way is tenant in severalty, and this is sole ownership. And tenancy in severalty is kind of confusing because when you look at the term, it looks like there are several owners. But when we say tenant in severalty, it means that your ownership is severed from anybody else. <coughs> so this is sole ownership. Second type of ownership is tenants in common. And this is typical of a hui, okay, uh, where maybe unrelated persons or parties pool their monies together to buy investment property. So you don't have the right of survivorship. So for example, every one of you along with me could form a hui to buy a property to invest in, build a home. And then we would set up, set up what our percentages are, yeah? 1%, 5%, 10%, whatever. When you pass away, your interest goes, if you have a will, according to what your will says. If you don't have a will, according to the laws of intestacy, okay? Uh, the third type of uh, ownership in real property is joint tenancy. And the distinguishing factor of a joint tenancy is the right of survivorship. Whoever lives the longest owns the whole thing. So for example, I could own my residence jointly with my two children. And because I'm older than them, the presumption or the probability is that I would pass away before them. And then when I pass away, they automatically own the property. Yeah? So if we own it jointly, uh, dad passes away, my two daughters own the property 100%. <clears throat> D is a tenancy by the entirety, and this can only be held between spouses, okay? So my wife and I own our residence as tenants by the entirety. If I pass away before my wife, she automatically owns the whole thing, even though I have a will that says I give it to, the ch to my children, okay? So remember now, how you hold ownership to your assets is real important because it Ownership can take precedence over what you have in your will or your trust. <clears throat> An important feature of tenancy by the entirety is creditor protection. Okay. For an attorney, I'm concerned that if I make a mistake, I might get sued for malpractice. For contractors, if they make a mistake, you know, somebody can get injured, they get sued. If I own my home or any other asset as tenants by the entirety, I have creditor protection. They have to show or prove that both my wife and I were at fault. <clears throat> so if I'm involved in a car accident uh, and I don't have enough insurance and they sue me, my house is protected because my, you know, my wife was probably not at fault. My wife's car, she owns under her own name. My car, I own under my own name. <clears throat> if I commit malpractice and I don't have enough uh, malpractice insurance and I get sued, <clears throat> they cannot attach my house, okay? My wife is not involved in my law practice. So generally, most husbands and wives own their residence, at least their residence as tenants by the entirety, just by virtue of the having the uh, Creditor protection. <clears throat> Question. So if I have a trust, should I put the property in trust or just rely on the tenant? Oh, that's a real good question. Okay. <clears throat> it used to be that for professionals, attorneys, doctors, contractors, we didn't put the residents into the trust because then we would lose the tenancy by the entirety uh, protection. Uh, about th two or three years ago, the legislature passed a law that says that if you owned your property as tenants by the entirety and then you transferred the property to your trust or, well, to your trust, you would still retain the tenancy by the entirety protection. Good question, so that's a new law Okay, so now more and more professionals, 
uh, contractors, people who are exposed to liability are transferring their residences and other real properties into their trust. <clears throat> How you own title to your assets is really important. Assets in your sole name or that you own as a tenant in common goes through probate, okay? Uh, probate is a court process where uh, ownership is changed judicially by the court, by the judge, okay? And we take care of your creditors. One of the objectives that you should have is to avoid probate, okay? Probate can be expensive and it can be time consuming. My office handles a lot of probates, okay? Uh, depending on your situation, I tell my clients, don't be afraid of probate because it isn't that bad. Uh, if I were to do, and, I, and it's explained here, yeah? Uh, if I were to do an informal probate, and by an informal probate, I avoid court hearings, uh, I get beneficiary approval for distribution. Uh, so there's really no conflict. I can do an informal probate for about $2,500 to $3,000. Compare that to a living trust. Yeah, you have uh, these Honolulu attorneys coming down, they're holding seminars, and they're really promoting the living trust type of estate plan. And you know, they're gonna charge you four or five, you know, maybe more, four or five, four to five thousand dollars. <throat> so we're gonna talk about trust and why a trust could be advantageous to you. And we're gonna talk about uh, <laughs> alternatives to trust that you can avoid probate without using the trust tool or mechanism. <clears throat> you know, for a lot of my clients, uh, <clears throat> The typical estate plan is if they're married, everything to the surviving spouse if alive, otherwise to their children in equal shares. <clears throat> and for something like that, a lot of them can get by with a simple will, <clears throat> even though their assets may go through probate. Because as I said, you know, the probate fees might be between $2,500 to $3,000. If we were to do a living trust, maybe I would charge them four to $5,000 or more. <clears throat> but the problem sometimes arises <clears throat> where you don't treat your children equally. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe you disinherit somebody or you give somebody a smaller share than the rest of them. Then you're risking a will contest and then you might want to do a living trust uh, or other type of trust, you know, just to avoid the publicity of a probate proceeding, which is, you know, open to the, to the public. <clears throat> it used to be that uh, probate fees were charged based on a percentage of the estate. So the larger the estate was, the bigger the fees were. <clears throat> Nowadays, the courts are saying to the attorneys, <clears throat> you have to charge a reasonable fee, okay? And a reasonable fee would be based upon the actual time spent on the, on the matter, yeah? So sometimes in probate, we are required to submit our timesheets and we have to justify our fees uh, if we do an informal probate, it's a lot cheaper than a formal probate. And in an informal probate, I can close up an estate if everything goes smoothly within six months. You know, you hear these horror stories about probates going on for years and all that. <clears throat> uh, you know, as long as there's no hassles from the beneficiaries, as long as everybody is treated equally, we can close it up pretty expeditiously. So I guess my point is, don't be too concerned about probate. <clears throat> I want to 
I'll talk about uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the rules of intestacy. If you don't have a will, <clears throat> then your solely owned assets will pass according to what the laws of the state of Hawaii says. A lot of people are under the misimpression that if a person dies without a will, then it goes to the state. And that's not true. Okay, it will go to the state if you pass away without a will, only if you don't have any relatives, okay? <clears throat> Your parents are deceased, you don't have any children, uh, you don't have any siblings, you don't have any nieces and nephews, uh, then it'll go to the state, okay? If you have cousins, it'll go to your cousins. <clears throat> so we have an ever-expanding tree, yeah? So first we look at the bloodline, spouse, children, parents, grandchildren. Then if there are no people in that circle, we expand the circle. Then we go to siblings, nieces and nephews. And if nobody in that circle, we expand it even more. Then we go to cousins, okay? <clears throat> uncles and aunts. If no one in, in those circles, then it goes to the state of Hawaii. <clears throat> in Hawaii, there's no common law marriage. <clears throat> so if you want to benefit your partner, okay, you, you really should do a will or you do a beneficiary designation. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. I have clients uh, that have partners, okay, uh, but they never bothered to get divorced. They, they got married uh, and, you know, they have differences with their spouse. So they're separated, but they never bothered to get divorced. <clears throat> so I was handling one. Uh, a couple of years ago, where a good friend of mine, I always thought he was divorced, okay? But then when, when I was doing his estate plan, he told me, oh, you know, Sh Sherman, we, we never got divorced. And I told him that under Hawaii law, a surviving spouse has what is called a right of election. <clears throat> and the right of election is the right to take against a spouse's estate plan. So, <clears throat> for me, I've been married a long time, <clears throat> uh, maybe f almost 40 years now. Even if I did a will or I did a trust that disinherited my spouse, let's say I gave everything to my children, okay, and I pass away, my spouse would have a right of election to take against my will or my trust. And depending on how long <clears throat> we've been married, and you know, almost 40 years, her right of election would be up to 50%, okay? Uh, so that's something to consider. It used to be that we could disinherit a surviving spouse by use of a living trust, but you know, the legislature's made uh, a, a policy decision that says, hey, no, we're not gonna allow that anymore. <clears throat> so for my friend, that is still married, but it has been separated for over 20 years. I told him, hey, your, your still wife has a right to, and oh, by the way, he did a will that left everything to his girlfriend. So I told him that his, his <coughs> wife that he never bothered to get a divorce from has a right of election. <coughs> and he told me, oh, Sherman, she's not gonna do that. <coughs> So we just left it like that. <clears throat> How you own title to your assets is real important. Yeah, we're gonna get back to that underlying theme, yeah. And I have at the bottom of page two, uh, reasons to avoid probate, cost, publicity, and time. But as I said before, you know, if we go through an informal probate, it's not too bad and it doesn't take too long. But you know, if you can avoid probate, then you know, why don't you? You can avoid probate by use of a trust. And we're gonna talk about trust. <clears throat> but there are a lot of alternatives to a trust. Okay, how you hold ownership to your assets is real important. 
Okay, at the bottom of page two, how to avoid probate. Number one, tenants by the entirety. As I said before, this is co-ownership only between spouses, okay? Creditor protection, right of survivorship. My wife and I own our, our residence as tenants by the entirety. Uh, usually the men die first. I pass away before my wife, she automatically owns the whole thing. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do a will that says it goes to her. She automatically owns the whole thing. <clears throat> Same thing with joint tenancy. Uh, typically, what, what some clients do is they own the property as tenants by the entirety, husband passes away, <clears throat> wife then sets up a joint tenancy with the kids. They add on the kids. Okay, so now it's mom and the children. Mom is older, so the probability is that mom is going to pass away before the kids, okay? Mom passes away, the children automatically own the property. Right of survivorship. Even if mom has a will, that gives it to somebody else. How you hold title to your assets is real important. <clears throat> Number three is a POD designation. You can do this with your bank accounts, your stocks, your mutual funds. And a POD designation is, for example, Sherman, Shiraishi, POD, payable on death, and then I would add on my kids. Okay, the advantage of that is avoid, it avoids probate. The advantage of that is that even though it avoids probate, my children really don't have any control over those assets until dad is dead, okay? A lot of times the problems with joint tenancy is that when you add your children's name, names onto assets, like your property or bank accounts, you're giving them control, okay? <clears throat> For bank accounts, it's not too bad because if you change your mind, you can just make a withdrawal, you take everything out, and you set up another account. The problem with property is that to take your children's names off once you put them on is that they have to sign off, okay? So once you add them on, you know, and then later on you, oh, you change your mind. So, oh, you know, I want to take your name off. Why? You know, then you're going to get problems with, with your kids and all that. <clears throat> so in a payable on death designation, usually we do that for bank accounts, uh, se <clears throat> securities, stocks, mutual funds. <clears throat> okay, turn to page three. Make sure you update or you periodically check your beneficiary designations on your retirement plans, your life insurance, uh, and any other you know, asset that you can name a beneficiary on. <clears throat> I see clients that when they were single, they named their parents as the beneficiary under their life insurance. I see that all the time. Parents are already deceased. Okay, so now if the client passes away, that asset will go through probate. I had an extreme example about, uh, <clears throat> well, extreme situation about 25 years ago. One of my good friends uh, was killed in a car accident. <clears throat> he was single, but he was going, he had a girlfriend, uh, but you know, they broke up and then she got married and she moved to Texas. So uh, my friend was living with his parents, he passed away, and he, and he was helping to pay the mortgage on the parents' home. But anyway, when we looked at his life insurance policy, he had his ex-girlfriend on as a beneficiary. Okay. <clears throat> we tracked her down in Texas. She, by this time, she was married and all that. And lo and behold, she had filed a claim on that policy. I guess the insurance company also tracked her down and said, hey, you're a beneficiary under your ex-boyfriend's policy. <clears throat> So we wrote her a nice letter saying that how, you know, this guy's parents were dependent on the life insurance proceeds, they were retired and all that, and we never got any response. So, you know, so check, make sure your beneficiary designations are current. 
Another situation that I'm dealing with now is uh, <clears throat> a lot of times people, you know, establish families without getting married, okay? So they have children from their relationship and all that. So I had one client whose uh, partner passed away. They were living together as husband and wife, but he didn't have a will, okay? <clears throat> In the meantime, you know, they had a mortgage on the home, and then they had three children together. So because they were not married, the three minor children became this person's heirs. So, you know, his life partner was excluded. So that could have been resolved by either doing a will or making sure that the beneficiary designation was current. <clears throat> So check your life insurance, check your pension plans, check your retirement plans. Okay. We talked about joint tenancy on real property. Yeah. Typical situation, one parent passes away, then the surviving parent adds the children's names to the deed, to the house, to avoid probate. Okay. Parent changes their mind. Oh, maybe, maybe the daughter or the son married somebody that they didn't like. Maybe they talk sassy to the parent. So they tell the child, hey, give me back the property. Okay, unless the child signs off. You know, hey, it's an irrevocable transfer. <clears throat> Another recent development in the law, maybe about two to three years ago, is a revocable transfer on death deed. And I'm doing a lot of those nowadays. Okay. <clears throat> this is similar to that transfer or payable on death designation that you can do on bank accounts, on stocks and bonds. Okay, and what, what the parent would do is for the house, you know, to avoid probate, it would be mom, transfer on death, and then they would add the kids' names on. Okay, under the old law, once you add your children's names on or anybody's names on to the house, if you wanted to take their names off, you would have to get them to sign a consent or sign a deed where they give up their interest in the property. Under this revocable transfer on death deed, if mom changes her mind, she can just revoke or amend the transfer on death deed and she doesn't even have to let her kids know about it. Okay. <clears throat> I advise my clients to keep control over your assets for as long as you can, okay? Because control is leverage. Once you give it away, you lose your leverage. <clears throat> Everybody knows the golden rule, right? He who has the gold rules, okay? So hang on to your gold. Once you give it away, you, you lose control. Sometimes we, we, we make gifts to qualify for Medicaid or, or for public assistance, but you know, that's a topic for <coughs> another day. <clears throat> so I like these transfer on death deeds. It, it can take the place of a trust, okay, because you know, it avoids probate. And if you change your mind, you can change this revocable transfer on death deed. Same like a revocable living trust, yeah? For a revocable, revocable living trust, if you change your mind, you can change the trust. <clears throat> okay, number seven uh, is the use of a trust. So we've been talking about ways to avoid probate. Where you have a, a, a happy family, your children are all grown up, they're in stable marriages, <clears throat> maybe you don't need a trust, okay? Maybe you can avoid probate uh, through use of joint ownership, uh, payable on death designations, transfer on death for your deeds. But a trust can be very useful <clears throat> if you have an estate tax problem. And for that, definitely we're going to recommend a trust. <clears throat> so if you have an estate of $5,450,000 or more, we're going to recommend a trust for you. Another situ other situations where we would recommend a trust is maybe you're in your second marriage. Maybe you have children from a prior marriage and then your, <clears throat> your, 
your spouse also has children from prior marriages. You have a you have a blended family, okay? So maybe you you would want to do something where you make sure that your children are not juiced out just in case you pass away before your spouse and everything goes to your spouse and she gives it only to her children or his children. <clears throat> or maybe you have a disabled beneficiary. And I have a lot of clients with uh, uh, beneficiaries with disabilities. And the thing that we want to avoid is that, hey, we love that beneficiary. We want to give him or her something. But on the other hand, we don't want to disqualify that beneficiary from receiving governmental benefits that he or she may be entitled to, like Medicaid, SSI, disability. So we can do a trust, and we call it a special needs or supplemental needs trust that will provide benefits to your loved one, your beneficiary, without disqualifying him or her from governmental benefits. <clears throat> Maybe you have a beneficiary that has a, a, a gambling problem, a substance abuse problem. Okay, we can do trust to protect him or her from their creditors, okay? For example, my daughter uh, got married, oh, maybe about eight, eight years ago. <clears throat> and my wife and I were concerned because you know, they say, oh, you know, one half of all marriages end up in divorce and all that. <clears throat> so we changed our estate plans to provide that if mom and dad were to pass away, whatever goes to our children will remain in trust for their benefit. Okay, they don't get it outright. So if they go through a divorce or, you know, that asset that came from mom and dad is not really considered to be theirs. And we put in special language about divorces and all that. <clears throat> Turns out that my son-in-law, he's such a great guy, so we're, we're very lucky. But, you know, these are some ideas that you, you, can, you can use that even though you may be deceased, you still have a string. You still have control over your assets. You know, I sent my kids to, uh, to college, and while they were in college, my wife and I were in poverty. You know, we really had to you know, watch what we spend our money on and all that. Now they finish college, they have their own, their own families. <clears throat> and then I am, I am grandpa. So I'm concerned about my grandchildren. I feel that I have given my children enough, okay? So the trust that I set up that's also going to protect them from their creditors is going to preserve the assets for the benefit of my grandchildren. <clears throat> I told my daughters, if you want to take a vacation, if you want to buy a car, if you want luxuries, you spend your own money, okay? If you're having a hard time because you have medical problems, uh, or maybe you lost your job, or there's you know, some expense that you did not anticipate, if mom and dad are alive, we're going to help out, okay? But if mom and dad are dead, we're deceased, we have this trust for the benefit for them, yeah, for their health, education, maintenance, and support based upon need, okay? And it's supposed to last for their lifetimes, and then when they pass away, then it goes to my grandchildren, so <clears throat> for what it's worth. I don't want my children to be trust fund babies, yeah? I want them to, you know, make sure that they're gainfully employed, they work hard, and, you know, be productive. <clears throat> Or here's, <clears throat> okay. You know why we do that? This is to keep you awake. <clears throat> you know, I, di I did this, uh, I think two years ago. And then people in the back were like, and, and I thought they were agreeing with me, but they were really nodding out. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, they added down to like 60. Let's go. <clears throat> yeah. 
Any questions so far? Um, I have a question. Sure. About the table on down. Is, what is that? Is that a form or is that is it a form you have to file? Is it strictly a Hawaiian thing? Is it for, for real property, it's a Hawaiian thing. Okay. Well, for a bank account, you just go to the bank and then you tell them you want to do a POD account or they, call, they also call it a Totten Trust. <clears throat> uh, so the banks, I think the banks call it a Totten Trust, yeah? So it, it would, and it, dep uh, it would be like Sherman Shore, you see trustee four, and then I would add my kids' names on, okay? Or Sherman Shore, you see payable on death. So it all depends on what financial institution you go to. <clears throat> You can also do that for uh, securities, for mutual funds, stocks, and then you get a special form. And then you can, you can download that form too. We've, we've done it uh, for uh, mutual funds and stocks. <clears throat> yes? You don't get property. You can do POD or property, please. POD, yeah. transfer on death, yep, right. Revocable trans on, on real property, yes. For you, I think you need a trust because you have a, a lot of assets. So, you know. This is, uh, uh, oh, I forgot the name of your restaurant. Mark. Liwi Cafe, Paul Miyake, Liwi Cafe, so. But come, we, we could talk about it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any other questions on trust and Yes. Well, uh, tenants file the entirety. How do you look to find out how your property is designated? You, you, you take a look at your deed. It would be on your deed. Unless you have a mortgage with First Line Bank and then they take your deed. <laughs> do you guys still do that? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't understand why. Why certain financial institutions, when they, they ask for your deed? <laughs> because you can always get a copy from the Bureau of Conveyances. We so, okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? I know I've been kind of skipping around and... Okay. They told me to spend time discussing the, a power of attorney and the advanced healthcare directive. And I have attached the forms that my office uses, okay? So if we were to do it for you, we would charge you $150 plus attorney time. So you can use this to fill it out. Okay, <clears throat> why don't we go over this and I'll explain this to you. By the way, I don't like this form, uh, but this is a statutory form. Hawaii adopted the Uniform Powers of Attorney Act uh, about two years ago. And this is the form that is mandated, well not mandated, but suggested under the act. If you use this form, you get certain protections. Okay. And it's pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> so why don't we go over this real briefly. Uh, so on the first page, I, and then you would fill in your name, name the following persons as your agent. And then you probably would put in your spouse's name or your children or whomever. And you can name a successor also where it says optional. And C says that in the event that you name two or more agents at the same time, said agents may act independently of one another or may act or must act jointly. Okay. You know your family better than, than me. Okay. If you're cho I have family sometimes that are dysfunctional. You know, you, you, name, you name one child over another, they say, hey, favoritism. Okay. Or let's say you name both of them, and then one child does something, and the other one undoes it. So you want to make sure they're on the same page. So in a dis dysfunctional family where they don't trust each other, sometimes we say, hey, your agents must act 
together. They cannot act independently of one another. And usually, I don't see what the problem is because your agents are supposed to act in your best interest, not in their interest. Yeah? So as long as it's in mom or dad's best interest, they're supposed to act accordingly. You know, But a lot of times, they don't. Okay, at the bottom of page one, the effective date. So you can pick either your agent's authority becomes effective right now when you sign, or only if you become disabled or you become incompetent, or maybe you're missing, or maybe you went to Thailand and they found some pakalolo in your baggage and you get imprisoned, you know. Uh, then that is what is called a springing power attorney. It only springs up in the event of your incompetency or disability. I prefer a power of attorney that is effective immediately. Because if you have a springing power of attorney and you bring it to the bank and all that, they're going to be asking you, oh, how do we know that uh, mom is disabled or incompetent? You've got to bring in a doctor's certificate and all that. <clears throat> And sometimes we get problems with the doctor's certificate because, you know, the, I've had one where they, didn't, they wrote it on a plain sheet of paper, no letterhead and all that, you know, and, and sure the banks are, or the credit unions are going to question that. And sometimes we ask for it to be notarized and then we get hassles from the physicians. So I prefer a power of attorney that's effective immediately because it can be real useful. You know, you might be on the mainland traveling and you forgot to pay your real property tax, okay? So with the power of attorney, your agent can pay your real property tax or file your tax returns or pay your bills. Of course, of course you have to trust your agent, yeah? Because you hear stories of uh, agents abusing their authority under the power of attorney and adding their names on to your bank account, taking credit cards, in their name, well, in your name, but they use it. <clears throat> okay, on page two, compensation, your agent is either entitled to compensation or not entitled to compensation. And usually in the powers of attorney that I do where we name a spouse or children, we say hey, they're not entitled to compensation. They're doing it for love. Okay. F is a revocation of, power, of prior powers of attorney. And usually we, we revoke all prior powers of attorney. Because we don't know what's floating, uh, out, floating around out there. Okay, G is the grant of authority to your agent. Okay, and you can specify or you can limit your agent's authority only to real property, only to filing your tax returns, only for dealing with a bank account, only for dealing with a specific asset, or you can initial the bottom all preceding subjects. If you initial all preceding subjects, then this is a general power of attorney. Whatever you could do that would be legal, you're authorizing your agent to do on your behalf, okay? So if you're appointing your spouse or your children, usually you'll uh, be initialing all preceding subjects. Okay. For my wife and me, since she's on all my accounts anyway and on co-owner, you know, even without a power of attorney, she can just withdraw everything anyway. So I would go all preceding subjects. <coughs> my wife told me, you know, <coughs> what's hers is hers and what's mine is half hers. So. Okay, page three, grant of additional authority. This is dealing with land court property and HIPAA information, the Health Insurance Portability and Accounting Act. You know, there's a federal law that makes all your medical information confidential, okay? In order to get access to medical information, your agent must be authorized to receive it. <clears throat> Last year, I dropped my brother off to uh, Wilcox Hospital. He had to have a procedure done, so I dropped him off. 
then uh, <clears throat> in the afternoon, I went to the uh, reception desk and I said, oh, what room is you know, my brother in? And they said, oh, we're not authorized to give that information and we're not authorized to even tell you whether he's in or not. And I told him, I dropped him off this morning. <laughs> you know, but because he didn't sign a HIPAA waiver authorizing me to receive information. And I guess when you check in too, you can say, at, uh, oh, yes, I want visitors and all that. You know, you can disclose that information. But because he didn't do that, you know, she, you know, they wouldn't even give me information. Many years ago, uh, <clears throat> my client's daughter, who was over age 18, was going to college on the mainland and uh, got admitted to the hospital. She was in a coma. Okay, so mom and dad flew up. Same thing, the hospital refused to give mom and dad information on their daughter's condition. She was over age 18. Okay, she did not sign a HIPAA waiver. So, you know, you can get some unintended consequences due to what the feds think is good for your protection. Okay. Another horror story <clears throat> told to me by an attorney friend uh, on Oahu that one of his clients, the mom wandered off, had, she had dementia uh, and wandered off. So they called the, the uh, HPD, the police department, and HPD suggested that they call the local hospitals. And the local hospitals refused to give out uh, information on you know, whether mom was there. A couple minutes later, they got a call from a hospital saying, oh, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but your mom is here. So you, know. so you get some people who, who are practical, may have been breaking the law, but you know, wanted to do, you know, wanted to be helpful. <clears throat> okay, so that was H2, the HIPAA waiver. I is a grant of specific authority, and this is optional. And usually we don't, recommend to clients that they initial any of the items uh, in I at the middle of page three. Sometimes we do estate planning last minute. The client might already be in the hospital on his or her deathbed. When we review the assets, when we review the life insurance, when we review the pension plans, they may have designated a beneficiary that they don't want those assets to go to. Or maybe they have a joint account and they don't want that account going to the survivor. So this allows your agent to change around the beneficiaries under your life insurance, your pension plans, your bank accounts, yeah? More for last minute kind of stuff. And this is why you should do your estate planning early. Review your, your assets, what you own, who's the beneficiary and who it's gonna go to. J is a grant of specific authority regarding gifts. And this is optional. Sometimes we wanna make a client poor. And the reason why we want to make the client poor is to qualify the client for maybe for Medicaid, SSI, food stamps, welfare, okay? So we want the authority to gift away assets. Another reason why we would want the authority to make gifts is because the client has a huge estate where if they were to pass away, there would be an estate tax liability. So we want the authority to make gifts to reduce the estate to the point where we don't have that estate tax liability. So J is a grant of specific authority regarding gifts, which is optional. And under the new Hawaii uh, Uniform Powers of Attorneys Act, you you have to specifically authorize your agent to make gifts. Okay. And then on page four is special instructions, which is optional. So if you wanted to limit your agent's authority, maybe to only a specific bank account at First Hawaiian Bank, you would initial on page two, uh, banks and other financial institutions. And then in the special instructions, you would say limited to account number so-and-so, 
at first line bank. And that way you, you limit your agent's authority. Maybe only for the payment of bills or making deposits. <clears throat> then we have a nomination of a conservator or guardian, which is optional. If you have a power of attorney, you know, this is supposed to take the place of a conservator or a guardian. Usually we only go into court to have a guardian or a conservator appointed when you don't have a power of attorney. But I guess this is the belt and suspenders approach, yes? So if it is necessary to appoint a guardian or a conservator, then, and usually we fill in your agent's name on this uh, section M. <clears throat> Okay, reliance on this power of attorney, the bottom of page four. Under the new Uniform Powers of Attorneys Act, a financial institution, bank, credit union, stockbroker, or whatever, is obligated to follow the instructions under the power of attorney, okay, or risk liability. Under the old law, there was no requirement that a bank or financial institution uh, follow the instructions under power of attorney. I do a lot of work for financial institutions. And a lot of times, they would use the smell test. Yeah, so if somebody comes in with a power of attorney uh, that is purportedly signed by a member and they come in to add their names onto the account or maybe to open up a credit card, the credit union would use the smell test. If it's a relative, a spouse, a child, then hey, it looks okay. If it's the housekeeper or a caregiver, then they will say, no, you, you bring in so-and-so so we can talk to him or her. And Kauai financial institutions, you know, they really protect their members. Uh, I guess Kauai is small enough that, you know, if something looks fishy, they would question it. Under this new Power of Attorney Act, as long as certain requirements are met, the financial institutions have to abide by the Power of Attorney Act. Okay, but anyway, there's this new requirement under the Act too that says that uh, an agent under a Power of Attorney who is not a spouse, uh, an ancestor or descendant may not use the Power of Attorney to benefit themselves. So the caregiver, the housekeeper, cannot use the power of attorney, even though it's a general power of attorney, to benefit themselves, yeah? Unless they're also your, your child or, or parent. Any questions under the power of attorney? Okay, let's talk about the advanced healthcare directive, commonly known as a living will to be distinguished from a living trust. Yeah, a living will says that if you have an incurable or terminal illness or condition, and if life support would only postpone the moment of your death, then you don't want life support, okay? This advanced healthcare directive has six separate documents in this. We have a power of attorney for healthcare, we have a living will, we have an organ donor section, we have a designation of a primary physician, independent living, and burial or cremation instructions. <clears throat> okay. We would charge about $150 plus attorney time or staff time to help you fill this in. So hey, this is worth the price of admission. <clears throat> which is free, so you get what you pay for. But anyway, so page three, part one, is a power of attorney for healthcare decisions. The power of attorney that we had just previously discussed was more for financial matters, yeah? Your banks, your property, paying your taxes, filing claims. This power of attorney is for healthcare decisions. <clears throat> if you are competent and you can communicate you're going to tell the physician, you're going to tell the hospital, you're going to tell your healthcare provider what you approve or do not approve of, whether you want pain relief. Okay, so you're going to be in charge of your own healthcare decisions. 
But just in case you are not competent or you cannot communicate, your agent can make those decisions for you. So we have a, you can fill in your agent's name. Uh, you can name an alternate agent. And we spell out your agent's authority to admit you to the hospital, to discharge you from the hospital, to sign waivers, to apply for insurance benefits, uh, anything to do with health care. Okay, on page four, number three, your agent's authority becomes effective when your physician says that you are not competent to make your own decisions. At any time prior to that, you can make your own decisions unless you sign number three. And we don't recommend that you sign number three. Yeah? You should make your own decisions. Number four, your agent's obligation is to follow your instructions even though they may disagree. And we've had a lot of problems, especially with children who sometimes have a hard time letting go. And they don't necessarily follow the instructions as, con as parents specify for end of life decisions. Yeah? And we, we have disputes among family members. So if you're gonna do a living will, uh, it's a good idea to discuss it with your children and just say, hey, this is what mom and dad wants. Okay. Page five is part two, and this is the uh, living will section, yeah? <clears throat> and it says that if you are satisfied to allow your agent to determine what is best for you in making end of life decisions, you need not fill out this part of the form. Okay. Uh, I recommend you do fill it out though, to make a decision. And you have two choices. Choice A is a choice not to prolong life, and choice B uh, is a choice to prolong life. And everybody picks choice A, yeah? Choice A says that you do not want your life prolonged uh, if you have an incurable or irreversible condition that will result in death with, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that will result in death within a relatively short time. <coughs> or you're in an irreversible coma, or you have brain damage or brain disease. <clears throat> so we use words like incurable, irreversible, permanent, okay? Because maybe if it is curable, you do want life support. <clears throat> Choice C is DNR, do not resuscitate. And it's not appropriate for anyone in this room, okay? Choice C is for uh, elderly clients who are already in a nursing home they may be confined to their beds. They're not ambulatory. So they're telling the nursing home operator, hey, if my heart or breathing should stop, no need to call 911. Okay. You know, if you call, I, I, don't, I really don't know how it works, but even if you have a living will, and if you call 911, you know, they're gonna bring you, uh, uh, they're gonna resuscitate you and they're gonna bring you to the hospital. <clears throat> Uh, my uncle uh, had, had cancer and so, you know, he, he took his own life and then my dad was there. But then my auntie called 911 and when the paramedics came, my dad told me, hey, don't do anything because he, this is what he wants. But then the paramedics told him, hey, somebody called 911. So they, they resuscitated him, they brought him to the hospital. So my dad went to the hospital also and then brought the living with all and, you know, so then I guess they, you know, they let him go. But, <clears throat> so I really don't know what the protocol is. If, if you call 911, you know, even though you have a living will, you know, they're gonna resuscitate you. And I see, I, I see this uh, POSD form, this, uh, that, Pro provides by the physicians, and they tell you to fill it out and put it on the refrigerator, okay? So that when the firemen come or the paramedics come, they'll see that and say, no, he doesn't want to be resuscitated. So I really don't know what the protocol or the experience of any... I don't know, I is there? But then, according to the paramedics, they're saying, hey, if you call 911, 
you know, hey, that means somebody called us and they're going to bring you to the hospital for, for treatment. So I don't know. But anyway, that's just a story. <clears throat> okay, page six, artificial nutrition and hydration. This is a Terry Shivo case, yeah, where a uh, <clears throat> uh, woman was in a coma. Husband wanted to disconnect life support. Okay. They disconnected life support, but she, she was being fed by a tube and intravenous fluids. Husband wanted to discontinue that. The wife's parents objected, and it went to uh, the Florida Supreme Court. And the Florida court says that unless you are specific on artificial nutrition and hydration, it will be provided. Okay. So now everybody's putting in artificial nutrition and hydration is to be provided or withheld depending on the choice that you pick. So if you pick the choice not to prolong life, you're also saying you don't want tube feeding or intravenous fluids. Okay. Number eight is relief from pain. This used to be an option in our form, but now we make it mandatory. Now it says you direct that you want pain relief even if it hastens your death. So this would be like morphine for cancer patients. And number nine is other wishes, yeah? Sometimes for religious reasons, uh, you know, they put down uh, no blood transfusions and stuff like that. Part three is organ donation. This is optional. And a lot of people are averse to organ donation. We just cross it out. But we have added in an option. If you look at the, the last two lines on page six, to benefit my immediate family members only. So a lot of clients who are averse to organ donation, when we ask them, hey, what if it's going to benefit your children or your grandchildren? Then they say, oh, then, then that would be okay. So then we would cross everything out and leave that direction to benefit only family members. <clears throat> you know, for, for physicians, ethically, uh, I don't know whether it's allowable for a patient to designate who gets their organs. Okay, I, I've read something that says that, you know, it, that may not be ethical, but we put that in anyway. <clears throat> Okay, page seven, part four, primary physician. Most Kauai people leave this blank because the doctors come and go if they find a better opportunity elsewhere. If you fill in your physician's name in part four, you're telling your agent to consult with Dr. So-and-so before any life or death decisions are made. Oh, let me backtrack a little bit. Okay. You want to make sure your agent, you know, we have that clause in here that says that, uh, hey, I expect my agent to follow my instructions even if he or she disagrees. Your agent has the right to go against uh, your decision to uh, end life support, okay? So if you have a child that has a hard time letting go, they can say, no, you do everything to keep mom or dad alive. Your agent has that right. I didn't know that, but your agent does have that right. You're shaking your head, Paul. I, I didn't know that, too. <clears throat> okay, part five is independent living, and this is optional. But mo we, we advise that you fill out part five, number 12. This is that you want to live in your home as long as you can. And if you are in a nursing or convalescent home, you always want to go back home to live. For Medicaid purposes, and Medicaid pays for long-term care, Medicaid is for poor people, but you can own your home and still qualify for Medicaid as long as you evidence an intent to go home, okay? If you already have dementia or you're not competent, you may not be able to evidence that intent to go home. So we're telling you do it now, okay? So that's the purpose of number 12. Part six, disposition of remains. This is optional. If you know whether you want to be buried or cremated, you can fill it in. If you have special instructions regarding scattering of ashes at Koke, <laughs> golf course, in the ocean, you can fill it in. If you have a burial or funeral plan, you can fill in that information to let your, your family know, uh, you know what type of plan that you have. But I suggest and I recommend 
that you let them know beforehand, but a lot of times they may not find your living will or advanced healthcare directive until after all the services are done. Okay. And with that, I think that ends my time. Oh, signing your living will. Okay. So on page eight, you have a, you know, you, can, you sign under 16. And you have two options. You can either have two witnesses uh, or you can have a notary. So it's either or. And with that, I think that's it. Any questions? Paul, yes. Yeah, I, it can be your children, but it cannot be a healthcare provider or a care home. Let me see. No, it cannot be your kids. Yeah, because I know your kids would, would, would gladly witness for you, right? <laughs> There's another question. How would a person change something in a sign advanced directive? Is it possible? Sure. Oh, you mean the, the person who originally did it? Yes. Oh, did they just do a new one? I've seen people just cross out stuff and all that. An initial. Yeah, but then the, well, it's not really that's filed in court. It's something that's going to be presented to the healthcare provider. But, but under the law, in order to have a valid advanced healthcare directive, you either must have two witnesses or it be notarized. So my feeling is that if you alter it after it's notarized or witnessed, then you may run into problems. It all depends on the, on the family or, or the physician. I think just to be safe, just do a new one. You know, there are a lot of farms out there. Oh, well, one last thing. One thing I don't like about the farms out there is that, uh, for example, you know, on page five, the choice not to prolong life or the choice to prolong life. In my form, you are required to sign it. In other forms, you just check it off. Uh. So people who want to make humbug, they can just, you know, check it off and, you know, you got two boxes checked off. Then what are you going to do? Okay. So that's why I don't like those other forms where you just check it off. I prefer you signing it. Question. Okay. A copy is valid. Under the, uh, the Advanced Healthcare Directive Law in Hawaii, a copy is just as valid as the original. But as in, my office also retains a, cop a signed copy. If you have a primary physician, you should provide him or her with a copy of your Advanced Healthcare Directive. When you go to Wilcox, if you voluntarily admit yourself and you fill out the form, and they're going to ask you whether you have an advanced health care directive. If you check off yes, they'll ask for a copy. So the hospital will also have it on file. What if you Question. were in another state? Does it make a difference? Does it Generally, for Hawaii, a, doc, a document that's valid in another state that was signed with all the formalities of that state will be recognized in Hawaii. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you're talking about what your trust you had for your kids and grandkids, those were statements and stuff that they needed. Right. Who enforces those restrictions? Okay, good question. The question is the trust that I set up for my kids. Who is the enforcer? Okay, because you cannot have the child be the trustee of his or her own trust. Yeah, you have the fox guarding the hen house. I have two daughters, okay? So Mari and Mia. For Mari's trust, 
Mari and Mia are the trustees, okay? But Mari cannot make distributions to herself or her family. Mia makes the distributions, but Mari can pick what she wants to invest in and all that. And same with Mia, okay? Now you run into the problem is what if one, one child tells the other one, hey, unless you make distributions to me, I'm not going to make distributions to you, okay? So I have a mechanism where they have the right to remove their sister as a trustee, okay, and bring in an independent trustee like a bank or a trust company. My two daughters get along, I know they're going to protect each other, but you never know what's going to happen, yeah? They might have a gambling, alcohol, or drug problem later on, yeah? So, but that's how I, that's how I did it. Yeah, selection of a trustee is real important. Yeah, you, you want to name somebody in, independent and somebody you can trust. And a lot of times, uh, the last resort would be a bank or a trust company, a bank like First Wine Bank or a trust company. But then they're going to charge you a fee. This may be a can of worms, but what, um, do you have any quick synopsis of what people are vulnerable to if you are the trustee for someone? Like legally, what you would just put yourself at risk of that you might not realize? Yeah, you're going to get sued if the beneficiaries. Uh, are dissatisfied with what you're doing. So, <clears throat> so be careful about, you know, being a, a trustee. Usually what we do is, is where we name an individual as trustee, that individual is only in charge of making distributions, accountings, uh, investments, uh, bookkeeping. You know, we put in a provision that they have the right to retain a bank or advisor to handle all the, those types of things. And all they are responsible for is just making sure that uh, distributions are properly made for health, education, maintenance, and support. Um, what is the agent voluntarily um, wants to be dismissed? Uh, wants to quit? Yeah. yeah. Care then, then they just resign. So our documents provide for, for that scenario. It's going to say, oh, if so-and-so cannot serve, then we have a replacement. Or a majority of the beneficiaries can pick a, a replacement, but it has to be a bank or a trust company, or you know, we put in conditions. Is there a form that the agent needs to fill out to submit? No, you can just say, I resign as trustee. Oh. Just simple as that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you very much.